Win big in 2023 with Team Sync from Roto Baller. Import your fantasy teams and sync your leagues. Get customized tools and tailored advice for your specific rosters and scoring settings, including live recommendations from the Live Draft Assistant, Free Agent Finder, and Lineup Optimizer. Sync an unlimited amount of NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL fantasy teams from all of the major fantasy platforms. Get a discount for any premium pass using my promo code NUCKLER. K-N-U-C-K-L-E-R-R-I-P to Tim Wakefield. Just visit rotoballer.com slash radio. Start rotoballing like a boss. Makes a great gift for the rotoballer in your life heading into 2024. This podcast is also brought to you by Parlay Play Fantasy Sports. They got free contests. They got paid contests. You go in, you pick a bunch of player props. You see how you did Go on, uh, use my referral link. I got it posted a bunch of different places and use my referral code ROTOBRADY to get that sweet, sweet deposit bonus. Thank you to those folks. And what's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you episode 113 of Roto Baller's official MMA podcast. Tap that. We got UFC Vegas 81 this weekend. Real quick. For all of my picks, for all other major and regional MMA uh, promotions, LFA, Cage Fury, Cage Warriors, there's KSW, Octagon, PFL, Bellator, One, Ryzen, Invicta, all the major boxing events. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Follow, like, subscribe, leave favorable reviews, spread some love for the podcast at Tap That MMA Podcast. That is where you can find it on YouTube, Spotify, and that's the Facebook page. I will be in the Rotoballer MMA Discord this weekend, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. The card kicks off at 4. Come out to the Rotoballer MMA Discord. Let's talk DFS and sports betting for UFC Vegas 81. Folks, UFC Vegas 80 was a doozy. I was beyond pissed. Felipe Lenz, who I was touting all week as my lock of the week, was out with an illness. The UFC knew about it. I had him in four out of four DFS lineups. He was my captain in a pick em game that I play uh, with, with uh, some of the usual suspects you've seen on here. I had, like, I don't know, two different, two separate bets across the board. Plus 125 was a bargain. I was beyond pissed. And the card played out bizarrely, and so did Dana White's Contender Series this week. Uh, the underdogs galore. Uh, I, I feel like just as I correct in one direction, uh, it, it, it zigs and zags on me. And, folks, I'm recording this on Wednesday night. Oh, my God, what a 24-hour. I keep saying 48 hours, but apparently it's been like over the last day. Islam Makachev versus Charles Oliveira is supposed to happen next weekend. Oliveira, Dubron gets cut over the eyebrow. He's out. Alexander Volkanovsky steps in in the rematch against Islam Makachev. And then what? Hamzat Shemaev is supposed to face Paolo Costa. Paolo pulls out because apparently he decided to get surgery on an infected elbow just a few weeks out from his fight. In steps Kamara Usman. And the winner of Hamzad Shemaya versus Kamar Usman is supposed to be next in line for a middleweight title shot. Um, also in news, the UFC is going to Saudi Arabia, holding their first event there. And Conor McGregor single-handedly defeated USADA just by... They, they just decided that they were done because they wouldn't bend the rules for Conor McGregor. I, that deserves a this. Break out the red panties. And obviously of that. It's been a whirlwind 24 hours. So fun to follow. This is, I, this is why you love this sport. Uh, things, things change. Plans are made on the fly. We end up, frankly, I'll say, I think UFC 294 is, a, is better now. Um, I was never that super interested in Hamzat versus Paulo because I don't particularly, like, I'm not a super fan of either. But, like, the Hamza versus Kamara Usman fight, that's an incredibly interesting matchup. I think Islam versus Volk, um, probably not as interesting as wanting to see Islam versus Charles again. But 
I think the first fight was so close that there's going to be so much intrigue and discussion leading up to it on who's going to take number two. And hopefully I can have Connor Sloan, Connor Bones Sloan on next week before UFC 294 to talk some of this madness. But folks, we got 12 fights for UFC Vegas 81. Let's go down the line. Strawweight fight between Ashley Yoder, 8-8, eight and eight, and Emily Ducote. Bantamweight, Chris Gutierrez, who was supposed to fight Montel Jackson. Uh, I think he was supposed to be on last week's card, and he was, he was inexplicably the underdog, and that fight didn't end up happening. Now he's fighting Alatang, Alatang Haley. And that, uh, yeah, Bantamweight. Another, a women's bantamweight matchup between 5-1 and one, Irina Alexeva and Melissa Dixon, who is a 5-0 and o professional fighter, the number two female professional coming out of the United Kingdom slash Ireland, according to Topology. A lightweight fight. Terrence, T-Rex, McKinney versus Brendan Marote. A bantamweight fight. Tynera Lisboa and Ravina Oliveira, another female bantamweight matchup on the card. Combined record, 13-3-1. Featherweight, Darren Elkins and TJ Brown. That can be a barn burner. Bantamweight, Christian Rodriguez, 9-1 against Cameron Simon out of South Africa. He is an undefeated 9-0 professional. The, I guess you can call it rematch. It's a rematch, even if it, the first one ended in a no contest. At an 130-pound catchweight bout, Edgar Chires against Daniel Lacerda. Middleweight, Michel Pereira. And by the way, he was supposed to fight Marc-Andre Barriot. And I, um, now, let's see, let's take a look. at. He was supposed to fight Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, too, July 29th. He said four straight fights canceled. Two against Wonderboy, one against Sean Brady, and one against Marc-Andre Barriot. He's had like six fights canceled since the start of 2022. And who's he taking on? Andre Petrovsky, the ultimate fighter veteran, 10 and 1 as a professional. I'm just going to say real quick Andre Petrovsky is an underdog, and I have learned not to fade that man. Bantamweight, Jonathan Martinez against Adrian Yanez. Banger. Co main event, Jennifer Maya and Vivian Araujo, women's flyweight. And the main event, certainly a sleeper main event, Sadiq Yusuf, 13 and 2 out of, Niger- out of Nigeria at featherweight against Edson Barboza. Edson Barboza, legend of the sport. I know that term gets thrown around a lot, but I think it's fair. Um, my God, let's get into it. By the way, also this weekend, KSW 87, Cage Warriors 161. Uh, there's, there's some boxing going on. And then within two weeks after UFC 294, because it gets kind of quiet there uh, in that UFC 294 week, unless they just haven't, Tapology just hasn't posted some of the bigger events. But then we have an Invicta event, Invicta FC 54, LFA 170, and Cage Warriors 162. Let's get into it, starting off with Ashley Yoder and Emily Ducote. Yoder is the plus 295 underdog. Ducote, the minus 375 favorite. Hold up. Look, Ashley Yoder has not been good. Uh, She has won one fight in her last five, and that dates all the way back to October of 2019. She has not fought in the UFC um, since 2021. And, yeah, that was her last fight. She was supposed to fight Vanessa Demopoulos at the start of 2022. Uh, maybe Vanessa Demopoulos would have gotten a, uh, a very controversial decision over her in that one, but it didn't happen. Speaking of which, my God, Kanoka Murata. Uh, Kanoka Murata um, that was a close fight, um, but a lot of outrage on the Internet about that one. I, I was... Very sur- I didn't think the damage was enough for Vanessa Demopoulos. I, I had a 29-28 Murata. I digress. You know, like Ashley Yoder, she has one win against Miranda Granger. That came November of 2020 in her last five uh, losses in that time. All by decision. All fights have ended on the judges' scorecards in the UFC. She did get two takedowns against Miranda Granger. She got outstruck 32-26. to 26. She's been out, you know, she's gotten outstruck pretty much, uh... Every fight except for her last one against Jin Yu Frey, which was a loss. She outstruck her 91 to 88, but it was the one fight where I, you know, like she didn't land her takedown. She didn't against Lavina Souza either, but she's usually good for about one or two per fight. Um, <coughs> she got taken down by Angela Hill too, March of 2021. Not a gr- 
Not a good recent sample size at all. Emily Ducote, on the other hand, born 1994. Loser at two in a row, but at least she's fought, I mean, in 2023, but, I mean, compared to Yoder, at least she has a fight within the last two years. She won her UFC debut outstriking Jessica Penne, 116 to 63. Uh, she got outstruck 182 to 71 against Angela Hill, outstruck 132 to 112 against Lupi Godinez, May of this year. I don't think... Like, this fight doesn't make any sense to me to have Dakota as that much of an underdog, or as that much of a favorite. I, I think the activity, the layoff, is obviously problematic. I think Dakota should be favored. And even if I was just looking at the resumes without the dates of those fights, I would think that too. But, you know, let's say Ashley Yoder hasn't lost a giant step. And by the way, her nickname Spider Monkey. That's worth a couple of points. She is seven years older, too. Not to ignore that. Do I think there's a possibility that Ashley Yoder at least lands 30 strikes and a couple of takedowns? Yes. But I do think that the just the recent sample size for Dakota at the UFC, and I think against you know better competition, um, you know, it, 132 to 112 against Lupe Godinez on the feet is not bad. She got taken down once by Lupe. I think that this could be a closer fight if Yoder is able to get, you know, one or two of her takedowns, depending on how the damage shakes out between the three rounds. But I think Dakota lands 70-plus strikes. I think that, depending on what her price is, she could be a really good sneaky value in DFS. Emily Dakota wins this fight 75 to 80 times out of 100, maybe even 85. And I'm going Dakota by decision. Um, and because I'm recording this Wednesday... Some of those props are still coming out, but I think Dakota, by decision, is going to be by far the best value there. Most, the most likely route of victory. Next up, Bantamweight, Chris Gutierrez and Alatang A. Lee. Hold on there. Chris Gutierrez, the minus 310 favorite. Alatang, the plus 250 underdog. Let's start with Alatang A. Lee. Winner of two in a row. Uh, he's one. He's, he's four, one and one. In the UFC, and his only loss is to Casey Kenny. Credit there. And Al- Alatang, um, he's landed, he's had fights where he's landed two, three, four takedowns. He got a knockout against Kevin Kroom. That's not, you know, I think that's a sleepy opponent. That happened back in April of 2022. His last fight was September of 2022. Unanimous decision victory over Chad and Hellinger. And Helliger. Uh, he outstruck him 49 to 39 and got two takedowns in that fight. Chris Gutierrez, on the other hand, he will have a one-inch reach advantage. They were both born in 1991. It's just been a different level of competition for Chris Gutierrez. Um, he did lose his last time out, but he outstruck Pedro Munoz 70 to, 77 to 60 April of this year. He did get knocked down once by Pedro Munoz. That can happen. That was a unanimous decision loss. He was on a four-fight winning streak before that against Andre Yule, friend of the podcast. Uh, former guest, I love uh, love Mr. Highlight. Decision over him, 69-59, to 59, the striking, a takedown each, and a knockdown for Gutierrez. Then against Felipe Colares, 96-41 to 46-41 in the striking. One takedown for Colares. It's a split decision victory for Gutierrez. Then he gets a second-round spinning back fist knocking against Dana Badgerow and a first-round knee knockout November of 2022 against Frankie Edgar. His, before, you know, his losses... In the UFC, Pedro Munoz, Rayani Barcelos, Cody Durden was a draw. Cody Durden was a draw. Um, I don't know exactly how I think. I, I think that you got to kind of opt for Gutierrez by knockout um, because I think that this is a fight lower than the level of competition than he's been performing against. And, you know, why they... Why it seems like he's only getting these kinds of matchups where he's going to be, you know, either a heavy favorite or, or the inexplicable underdog handicapping that he was getting against Montel Jackson early. I think Chris Gutierrez is just a, a far better fighter for the for this uh, for their age, it's, which is the same. Gutierrez has been performing against a better level of competition. Alatang has had way less activity. Um, they they each really only have you know good losses for the most part. I think Gutierrez wins this fight 75 times out of 100. 
maybe even 80. I'm not touching a straight-up victor here, uh, but I think Gutierrez by TKO knockout is going to end up being your best value. And I think that he's going to be pretty, pretty popular uh, when it comes to DFS. Next, oh, we got Irina Alexeva against Melissa Dixon. Let's start off with Melissa Dixon, who will be making her UFC debut. She's the minus 148 favorite. Irina, the plus 124 underdog. Melissa, no mess. Dixon, 32 years old uh, and 5-0. and She came in via Eras FC. Um, you know, her last two opponents had a, or let's say her last three, 9-5, and 16 and 5 combined records of those three opponents. Um, credit, you know, it, she cut her teeth a good amount in, in her amateur career, took some losses, got some wins, you know, in that uh, IMMAF uh, stuff in, over in Europe. The, you know, we see pretty good results from those fighters for sure. Then Irina Alexeva, UFC debut April of this year. First round knee bar over Stephanie Egger. It was 18 to 9 on the striking for Alex Siva when the fight got, you know, when the fight was terminated via that submission. So, you know, to go back to Melissa Dixon real quick, she's never been submitted in her amateur or her pro career. I think that Melissa Dixon is. It seems like she's good. I'm surprised to see her as the favorite here, especially when there's only, you know, Irina's only one year older. Um, you know, the Stephanie Edgar win, you could poke some holes in that for sure. She also has a win against Stephanie Page in Bellator. That was all the way back in October of 2021. I I don't know. This is question marks all over when the, the fighters only have a combined 11 professional fights, one's making their UFC debut, one has one UFC fight. I, I think on, you know, the resume alone, you know, matchup-wise, if Melissa Dixon does want to take it to the ground, I just don't, I think that I trust Irina's experience against a higher level of competition. I don't know. I think you kind of have to call this like a 50-50 fight. And if, and if I'm going with someone there, I'm going with the underdog. Irina Alexeva, plus 124, hit it. Next up, we got Terrence McKinney and Brendan Marote. Terrence McKinney is the minus 500 favorite. Good for T-Rex. Marote, the plus 380 underdog. Let's start with Marote. Again, 8-1 as a professional, 26 years old, making his UFC debut. He comes to us via combat zone. Now, here's the thing. I'm trying to get out of this a little bit, but this one's kind of hard to ignore. One career, one professional loss by decision. Um, he got subbed in his first amateur fight back in February of 2016. He's been he's been in CES. That's a that's a reputable organization for sure. Uh, here's the problem, man: is that the opponent that he last beat, Lionel Young, in Combat Zone 81, August of this year, so very recently, 11 and 20. 11 and 20 was the man's record that he beat. That's what his warm up fight was before making this debut against Terrence McKinney. Terrence McKinney, of course, 29 years old. He's had an up and down run because he's had to fight some tough guys. He was on a really good winning streak from LFA up to, you know, the Ferris Zayam win. Then he got knocked out by Drew Dober. Then gets a, a sick rear naked choke standing up against Eric Gonzalez. His activity level was great. I mean, he's fought three times in 20, uh, 2023, and even though he's lost two of three, he's coming off a win because he lost by two straight second-round finishes, a knockout against Ismail Bonfim, and then a rear naked choke to Nazim Sadikov. But he's coming off an August uh, August 12th victory by first-round knockout over Mike Breeden. I mean, like... The real issue here is finding a prop that is of value. Um, because I, I think McKinney wins this fight like, oh, 85 to 90 times out of 100. I, I think McKinney has struggled to get past a certain level of fighter. He's maybe dropped a couple that he wasn't supposed to, but not to this, not to this level. And if you have not fought at the UFC level, if your last opponent has lost 
almost double the amount of fights that he has won in his professional career. You're in for a rude awakening against T-Rex. I, I think that, you know, the analysis of this one's kind of simple. My God, Terrence McKinney was supposed to fight Chris Duncan um, on this card. And it's Moreau just stepping in as a late replacement. Now, I don't think that this is a risk either of Terrence McKinney looking past him. I think Terrence McKinney in these fights, I, I think, is going to be looking to make an impression because it's been so up and down for him. So, you know, I, I think that... Rhodey's never been knocked out. He's been subbed early in his career. I think if you were stringing together a parlay, I think like McKinney inside the distance would be probably a fair number. I think most likely you go McKinney by submission, but that's the thing. I might want to stay away from that, especially with the late replacement at... Uh, and who, you know, what Moroche's sample size is against. That's what I might want to stay away from. I think Terrence McKinney is going to be great for DFS. I think that's going to be worth the money spent there. Um, otherwise, you know, you're kind of trying to pick between TKO, you, you know, between a knockout for T-Rex and a submission. Um, oh, man. I don't know. I think ultimately you lean towards a submission. Uh, you know, Mike Breeden has been knocked out several times in his career. We just don't know for Morote. So I think inside the distance is probably going to be your best value. I just, you know, I, I don't think that that's going to be uh, a sexy prop pick, um, you know, at plus money or anything like that. I think, oh, if I had to guess, I'd probably say Terrence McKinney inside the distance, probably going to be like minus 275, um, maybe even higher, maybe minus 300. That's what I think about that one. I, I think, you know, credit to Morote for stepping up, and this is a big fight for him, and he's probably going to get, you know, a, a couple more UFC fights as a result of stepping in as a replacement. Next up, we got a women's bantamweight matchup between Tynera, Liz Boa, and Ravina Oliveira. Odds. Oliveira, the plus 270 underdog. Liz Boa, the minus 340 favorite. Let's start with Ravina Oliveira, 7 one and one as a professional 26 years old six wins by knockout one by submission all inside the distance she's been subbed once it was in her second professional fight so she's had two wins so far in 2023 opponents combined record eight and five but her last opponent's record was eight and five two fights ago her opponent was zero and zero she fought three opponents straight who were making their professional debuts um haven't heard of any of the organizations that, you know, she was in before that. She picked up a couple of belts. Uh, the CT, CT Westville Cruise Bantamweight Championship, July of this year. And then the LKC Flightweight Championship um, before coming into the UFC. Then Liz Boa. In her UFC debut May of this year. Third round, rear naked choke against Jessica Rose Clark. She was outstriking JRC. 42 to 26. They each landed a takedown. Before that, Lisboa, who is 32 years old, uh, had, you know, and this is the thing, too, is like, this is why I kind of got to get just a little bit away from this. I mean, she had fought, my God, Valentina Shevchenko in Muay Thai. She had fought Norma Dumont in her professional MMA debut. It's She fought someone with the last name Cyborg. It's not the one, it's, you know, it's not the Cyborg we're used to, but uh, it sounds dangerous to fight anybody with Cyborg in their name. It's just so hard to tell who you're actually fighting, even if your opponent is one in four. Like, was, you know, um, Lisboa's fight before coming into the UFC. I, I do think that beating Jessica Rose Clark, um, I think that already shows that you're of a certain competency level and, and professionalism here. Again, this is a... I don't like this one from a betting perspective. I, I don't want to go Oliveira plus 270. Um, but like Lisboa, I don't know if there's going to be any props that I... I think Lisboa probably wins this fight like 70 to 75 times out of 100. So maybe Oliveira plus 270 mathematically is the better value. I just don't know. Like, this is a really hard outcome-wise thing to pick. If I'm going with anything, I'm going Lisboa by submission. Um, 
I think that's as good as it gets. I'm not even going inside the distance. I think if you're picking a method of victory, Lisboa by submission. If you're going on Lavera, I would actually go TKO knockout because, my God, that's six of her seven professional wins. So I think there's a pretty clear path to go with either of them. But, again, I, I can't see me you know, being too enthusiastic to bet on that fight or to use either of those fighters in DFS. We just don't know as much. Um, but it's going to be interesting, you know, because – there's things to figure out at women's bantamweight, women's featherweight. So uh, I'm glad that, you know, the, at least some things at the bottom rung of that division are going to get shaken out on this card. Next up, we got Darren Elkins and TJ Brown. Break out the red panties. This is going to be a good fight. As many people have been pointing out on the internet this week, Darren Elkins is a dog uh, in... Uh, in the you know the betting sense and in the uh, the spirit sense, odds wise, Darren Elkins the plus one sixty four underdog, TJ Brown minus one ninety eight as the favorite. Let's start in with TJ downtown Brown downtown TJ Brown is obviously the way that you say that. You know a lot of good fighters on this guy's resume, uh, not above you know a certain level, but you know certainly a bunch of fighters who are really competent. Kai Kamaka. Charles Rosa, who he, he beat by decision with a combined uh, 140 strikes and eight takedowns. He took that loss by unanimous decision to Shylin Nerdam Becky. He got out truck 47 to 42, taken down three times to one. He has one win, um, you know, in the last 365 days. December of last year, a third round arm triangle against Eric Silva. He is coming off a loss to the 10 means of this division. Bill Algeo. That was the second round rear naked choke. He was getting out of trucks 64 to 46 as well. Darren Elkins is six years older. Darren the Damage Elkins, born in 1984, the George Orwell year. And even he, he's won three of his last five, going back to November of 2020. And there's, you know, been a bit of a layoff. Uh, he, he lost the fight to Cub Swanson by first-round knockout. He did knock out Derek Minner in the second round back in July of 2021. I don't know that we can't trust a Derek Minner result, can we? Because that guy threw a fight. Um, April of 2022, unanimous decision victory over Tristan Connolly. Outstriking him, 75-66, to 66, five takedowns. Last time out, loses a unanimous decision to Jonathan Pierce. Getting on truck 110-57, to 57, two takedowns each. Can't hold that too much against him. I think this is a really good matchup for Darren Elkins. I think that if they want to make this, you know, if, if this is on the feet, I don't think TJ Brown is so far advanced that he's going to be able to get a giant gap uh, over TJ Brown. And I think Darren Elkins will be able to get his takedowns against TJ Brown. Uh, and so I think that is going to make a lot of the difference. I don't think Darren Elkins gets subbed by TJ Brown. I think that, I, I just think it's an excellent matchup. You know, I, TJ Brown, the, his highest striking total in the UFC has been 82. That was back against Kai Kamaka. Darren Elkins, you know, 75, 121 against Nate Landwehr, um, 82 against Alexander Volkanovsky, July of 2018. Uh, and he's been in the UFC for so long, picked up wins over Michael Johnson, Dennis Bermudez, Hatsu Aoki, Steven Seiler, Diego Brandao. I'm working backwards. His, his debut was a win over, over Dwayne Ludwig, for God's sake. I, I think that, again, this fight's probably going to take place all over. It's going to be high pace, high intensity. And while TJ Brown, I think, deserves to be favored, I think ultimately Darren Elkins wins 45 to 50 of these out of 100. Plus 164. Give it to me all day. Hit it. One of my favorite picks of the week. Outcome-wise, I don't feel the need to pick an outcome. Um, but let us I, I think maybe you go Elkins by decision. I, I don't think that he puts TJ Brown away either. Um, if Darren Elkins did put him away, I, I don't know. I guess maybe by, maybe by submission, I could see that. Uh, just, you know, in a scramble. TJ Brown, you know, if he gets the victory, I think that's most likely by decision. But, you know, I'm very comfortable just going straight up. Darren Elkins plus 164. Next up, Bantamweight. Christian Rodriguez and Cameron Simon. Another one of my favorite fights of the week. Cameron Simon. 
This man's the plus 130 underdog out of South Africa. Cameron Simon. One comment, man. One comment. No, don't be scared, homie. No reason to be scared against Christian Rodriguez, the minus 155 favorite. I I question that handicapping for sure. Cameron Simon ranked as the number 40 band weight in the world. Christian Rodriguez, number 51, according to Tapology.com. Let's start with Christian Rodriguez, who is 25 years old, 71 inch reach. Seven of his career wins are inside the distance, three by knockout, four by submission. Two wins by decision, and his only loss is by decision. Now, why is this guy getting, you know, so much credit? Well, he's got, you know, he's been around some of the bigger feeder promotions, LFA, Cage Fury. He had a win in the Contender Series before making his UFC debut against Reyes Cortez by unanimous decision. Uh, You know, then loses to Jonathan Pierce. Very understandable, as we've already said. He actually outstruck Jonathan Pierce 26-18. to 18. He was taken down six times to two. Explains the result on the judge's scorecard. He landed 78 strikes against Reyes Cortez. In round two, a decision. Three of his four fights have gone to the judge's scorecards. He got that anaconda choke against Joshua Weems, who did land two takedowns and was doubling up Rodriguez on the feet, but that was a first-round finish. There's still, a lot of, there's still a lot of time left in that. That was almost a year ago to date, October 29, 2022. Why is Christian Rodriguez getting a lot of this credit? Because last time out, April of this year, he landed a unanimous decision and victory over Raul Rosas Jr. The thing is, he didn't have to weather much of a storm, right? He didn't take much damage. Raul Rosas Jr., he's been a phenom. A lot of people love him. A lot of people hate him because he's such a young prospect, too. He landed two strikes, three takedowns against Christian Rodriguez. He landed 29 strikes in a takedown. Ultimately... But uh, I'm not impressed by your performance, and I look forward to seeing I wasn't impressed by his performance, but I am looking forward to seeing this. It it was big to to derail the Raul Rosas hype train, but the kid was 18 years old at the time. Christian Rodriguez is pretty young, too. I mean, he's only a few months younger than me. December 1997 is his birthday. Cameron Simon, though. Can't sleep on what this guy has been able to do. Four wins at the UFC level to uh, include the Contender Series. He got a knockout against Joshua Wang Kim, August of 2022. Third round knockout. He was out striking him 57 to 38. They each landed a takedown. Then UFC 282, 53 to 11 in the striking. He did get taken down five times by Steven Kozlov, but gets the third round knockout. Then he's really bounced back in a major way against Mana Martinez, March of this year. Majority decision. Outstriking Mana 117 to 60. He landed the only takedown of the fight. And he got a knockdown in route to that victory. You know, I like Mana Martinez, you know, with, with any given fight, too. So that was impressive. And then Terrence Mitchell, his last time out, July of this year. First round knockout, uh, and he landed two takedowns in that time. Look, uh, Raul Rosas Jr., that guy's going to be around for a long time if he wants to be. Uh, and, you know, if, if he, he keeps improving, he's got nothing but time and, and a really high ceiling. So that win was impressive. And, you know, again, I can't hold anything against anybody for losing to Jonathan Pierce. Cameron Simon has just looked fantastic in the UFC. And, you know, the one kind of, you know, there's been some shaky aspects, like against Kozlo getting taken down five times, but he's just always dangerous. Two third-round knockouts, one in the first he wins on the judges' scorecards, too, and he racked up 117 strikes. He's going to be a popular pick in DFS. I don't blame that. I, I, I completely see why. The only issue is, like, you know, Jonathan Pierce didn't put um, didn't put Christian Rodriguez away, and he has plenty of finishes in his UFC run. I don't know that Cameron Simon gets the finish, but we don't need to do that, right? Because I think Cameron Simon should be favored in this fight. Wrong fighter favored. Cameron Simon wins this fight 55 times out of 60. Plus 130. Lock of the week. Hit it all over. I'm saying lock of the week, but then I know what the next fight is on this, uh, or one of the next two. Um, But absolutely, Cameron Simon, plus 130, and whatever the price is in DFS, strongly hit it.
love Cameron Simon. I can't believe he's the underdog here. You got to get it out of your head that Vegas might know something we don't know because what we've seen in front of us says that Cameron Simon, the the odds should probably be flipped around. Next up, at an 130-pound catchweight bout, Edgar Chirez and Daniel Lacerda. Lacerda, the plus 280 underdog. Chirez, the minus 355 favorite. Y'all remember how this last fight happened? Chirez was on a two-fight losing streak coming into the UFC. He lost in the Contender Series to Clayton Carpenter. Outstruck 79-51, to taken down three times. Then he got beat by unanimous decision July of this year by Tatsuro Tyra. Can't blame him there. Tyra is one of my favorite prospects in all the sport. One of my favorite fighters to watch in all the sport. Then, last time out, very early in the fight, he was up on in the striking numbers, 12-4. to 4. He got taken down once by Lacerda. Snaps on a guillotine. And it looked like Lacerda's arm went limp. The fight got stopped. Ultimately, they review it. They say that Lacerda didn't tap. He was conscious. It's a no contest. <sighs> but uh, I'm not impressed by your performance. And I look forward to seeing... And I'm not directing that at anybody in particular. What I mean by that, it, you know, you, you'll hear me say this if this ever happens again. You probably heard me say it, you know, since then. You cannot let your arm go limp. Uh, I don't blame anybody for this, and if you have to call it a no contest, fine. But consciousness works weird. You can be unconscious for a millisecond. Your arm can go limp, and you can wake up in a second. And go, I was just conscious. I'm sure that's how Kamara Usman woke up after the Leon Edwards fight where he got dropped with the head kick. But, obviously, different circumstances. But, if you're Daniel Lacerda, you can't let your arm go limp. It's as simple as that. If if a guy, if the ref picks up your arm and you go limp noodle, you have nobody to blame but yourself. You give a thumbs up, you know, you know, tense your arm, make it firm, make it clear that you're conscious. Because watching that replay, you can't blame the ref for anything. It, Lacerda did not respond the way a conscious fighter does. So I, I blame no one for that, I guess, but Lacerda. Lacerda, four losses in a row in the UFC and then the no contest, which otherwise would have been a loss. Now, granted, what I will say for Daniel Lacerda, also born in 1996, is he faced a pretty tough stretch of opponents. But my God, they, put in, they absolutely worked him over. Jeff Molina knocked him out in the second round. He got subbed by first-round uh, knee bar by Francisco Figueredo. Knocked out in the first round by Victor Altamirano. Knocked out in the second round by C.J. Vergara. Uh, we've seen just more impressive performances here. Uh, you know, Chires has more to show even without a win in the UFC than Lacerda does for all his time. He's had plenty of opportunities to pick up a win. Uh, granted, it's been a tough slew of opponents, but frankly, he was about to lose that fight against Chirez. If the fight would have continued, uh, you know, if you think that that should have resulted in a submission, it, it's just weird. You have to call that a no contest? Like, a, a guy was very close to getting a submission. It, it's just crazy. I, it's so crazy that it makes me afraid to pick Chirez just out of the fear of, that like the weirdness is, but I don't, I want to get that out of my head. I think you have to go, you know, I think you have to opt with Chirez wins this fight 80 times out of a hundred. Um, and what the hell let's go Chirez by submission plus plus one eighty. I don't know what, what phrase to use capture and lightning in a bottle. It's some, something like that. I, I think that that would be beautiful poetry for Chirez to end up getting this victory by submission. And plus 180, I, I think that's a pretty solid number. Hit that. Ow! But, you know, most of the analysis for that fight is like, man, you cannot let your arm go limp. Uh, th- that's it. That, that's, that's the end of that discussion. You, you cannot let it look like you're not intelligently defending yourself or awake. So now we move on to a great fight. Late replacement Middleweight, Michelle Pereira against Andre Petrosky. Petrosky, the plus 154 underdog. Pereira, the minus 185 favorite. Let's start with Pereira because, like I said, he's had some unfortunate luck. A bunch of different fights canceled against high levels of competition. 
Pereira is on a five-fight winning streak, dating back to September of 2020. His last fight was May of 2022, though, because of all those cancellations. Damn. Um, against Zalim Imadov, third-round rear naked choke victory. He landed 88 strikes as well. Against Chaos Williams, gets the unanimous decision, kept the striking numbers close, and landed two takedowns. Against Nico Price, he outstruck him 92-76, to 76, landed three takedowns to nil. Against Andre Fialo, avoids the big shots of Fialo and tunes him up to the tune of 107 to 45. Lands a takedown for good measure. And then the last time out, gets a split decision victory in what was a very close fight against Santiago Ponzinibbio at UFC Fight Night Home versus Vieira. 110 to 105 on the striking. It was Santiago that landed the one takedown, and that is probably why it ended up so damn close. Petrosky. My ear itch if the audio sounded weird there for a second. Andre Petrovsky, two years older, quietly, ever so quietly, because this guy's last loss was to Brian Battle in The Ultimate Fighter. Brian Battle, who has looked fantastic in that time since. His only other loss was Aaron Jeffrey, a guy that has been on this podcast, first of all. Shout out to him. And Aaron Jeffrey, a guy that, you know, has really worked his way up the Bellator rankings, uh, you know, since he, you know, lost to Kai Borello on the Contender Series. The wins that Petrosky's picked up, Michael Gilmore by third round TKO knockout. Okay, that's like, that's like a replacement level fight, and that was already back in August 2021. Nutty. Then gets a third round arm triangle choke submission against Hu Yazong, outstriking him 72 to 25, landing four takedowns. Um, so that was eight takedowns combined in his first two fights in the UFC, official fights. Then, very early on, finishes Nick Maximoff with an anaconda choke. That was like Petrovsky, like plus 240 or plus 275. That was easy money. Um, November of 2022, unanimous decision victory over Wellington Tournament, 42 to 41 on the striking for Petrovsky, eight takedowns to one. And then Gerald Mearshart outstrikes Petrovsky, 76 to 57. Petrovsky lands two takedowns to one and a knockdown. <sighs> like, Michelle Pereira has beaten a very steady level of competition. Like, that's a very, it's a wide middle tier, but like Chaos, Nico, Fialo, and Fialo really has done nothing but lose as much as I like that guy on paper. And Santiago Ponzinibbio, that's a very steady level of competition. Petrovsky has shown the ability to move up. And, you know, he's not super young. He's like 33, I think, or 32 at this point. That's how that math adds up. The Gerald Mearshart win was huge, even though it was a really close decision. A combined, oh, what is it, 18 takedowns across five fights in the UFC, and he didn't even have to land one against Nick Maximoff. You know, I, I think that... Here, Pereira is going to outstrike Andre Petrovsky. He's going to, you know, it's going to be probably even more maybe than the, the Gerald Mearshart, um, you know, numbers. But Petrovsky can limit that by using his strength, relying on his takedowns. I, I, I think that it would be, you know, best suited for Andre to not engage in a bunch of striking, you know, even though... He's shown the ability to land good volume. It was not against the likes of Michelle Pereira, who, um, and it's weird that these guys actually have the same reach. I think that this is a good matchup for Petrovsky as well, and I, I think that he's going to be focused for this. Pereira, you know, has had his eye on bigger competition, and it, things keep falling through. And when you just want to get a fight in, as I recently discussed with friend of the podcast, Ilyas Mamadaliev, that it puts you in a weird mindset. Petrovsky, if he just lands 40 to 60 strikes, even if Pereira lands upwards of 80 plus, if Andre does his thing with his takedowns, lands two, three, four, which I think is a very good possibility, this is a fight that Andre could win. This could be a very close decision for sure, but I think Andre wins this 40 to 45 times out of 100. Right now, this could even be a 50-50 fight, as crazy as that sounds. I, I, I think that that's how the matchup works out. Petrovsky plus 154, one of my favorite picks of the week. Hit it. Oh! I would go Andre by decision. That's plus 240. I really like that. Um, so far, I think my locks of the week are Petrovsky plus 154, Simon plus 130, and Darren Elkins plus 164. 
But my God, if Andre Petrosi gets that, you know, it's it, it's weird in a middleweight division that is so tough and so competitive that there are guys that are sleepy, like the Petroskis or, you know, Chris Curtis over the last couple of years that can make a quiet run getting surprising victories. And Andre Petroski, even though he was kind of that last year over the last two years, who knows? He could be the Chris Curtis of this year or of, of this next, you know, 365 days. Very interesting fight and a dangerous one for Michelle Pereira to get in place of the opponents he was supposed to have. Next up, we are to, not the co-main event, we have three fights left. Jonathan Martinez versus Adrian Yanez in a Bantamweight matchup. Martinez, the minus 115 favorite. I think there's some line movement there. Um, I'm kind of surprised to see Martinez favored. I, I figured it would be a closely handicapped fight, but I thought Yanez would end up being the slight favorite. But Yanez, the minus 105 underdog, Let's start with Adrian Yanez. Yanez, born in 1993. He's fought a lot of tough guys in the UFC. Uh, been around since August of 2020 when he won by first round knockout in the contender series over Brady Huang. Every fight other than the Davy Grant fight, in which he landed 100 strikes to Davy Grant's 98 and won by split decision, has been a knockout. Now, a first round knockout over Victor Rodriguez. Third round knockout over Gustavo Lopez. Second round knockout over Randy Costa. Then the victory over Davy Grant. His last win was June of 2022. Don't necessarily love to see that. First round knockout over Tony Kelly. He was out striking 35 to 20 at the time. Um, I think that these guys too, I think Yanez and Martinez are probably going to be priced in the like 15 to 19 dollar range. Um, and I think they're both going to be popular. I think you might see, you know, me using possibly one of each in, in my DFS lineups. But I'm going to hold that until I talk about Jonathan Martinez. Adrian Yanez's last fight, April of this year, he got knocked out in the first round by one Rob Font. He was keeping it close on the feet, but ultimately it, it was just too much to handle uh, skill-wise. Um, you know, Yanez is a dangerous fighter, but that was a big step up in competition against Rob Font. The question is, is Jonathan Martinez closer to the level of competition that Adrian Yanez has already beaten? Or has Jonathan Martinez since moved past that level? Because he's done incredible things in the, this stretch of the last couple of years. Uh, and he has a loss to Davy Grant. March of 2021, he got knocked out in the second round. And that's significant because Adrian Yanez took 98 strikes from Davy Grant and didn't go down. Um, Jonathan Martinez has been around for a while too, October of 2018. And you know, he fought Andre Yule, Mr. Highlight. He lost. Uh, he got outstruck 80-66. to 66. The volume wasn't once a problem for Jonathan Martinez. And, you know, now he's able to kind of throw together a complete fight a lot better. Let's talk about this five-fight winning streak he's on since that Davy Grant loss. Starting in October of 2021, unanimous decision victory over Zaviad Lazifshvili. Outstruck him 92-63. to 63. Then a unanimous decision victory over Alejandro Perez, February 2022, outstruck him 74 to 52 and weathered a knockdown en route to the win. May 2022, unanimous decision victory over Vince Morales, 88 to 51 on the striking, two takedowns for Martinez. And now I'm already seeing that I'm going to love Martinez in DFS because he's been, you know, wh whether it's a finish or a fight that goes the distance, he he's compiling statistics well. Um, and, you know, then he gets the knockout over Cub Swanson. That was a close fight, you know, kind of on the striking. Cub landed a takedown, but ultimately Martinez landed, knocked him down twice uh, in another knockout loss for Cub Swanson in that run. That was October of 2022. Last time out, by far the biggest win of his career, a unanimous decision victory over Saeed Nurmagomedov. He got outstruck 47 to 38 and got taken down three times. Um, it was 29-28 on all three judges' scorecards, but it was unanimous for Jonathan Martinez, the way it shook out. His strikes are just, he's throwing them with volume, and they're landing so effectively. They're doing the damage that they're supposed to. He is making every strike count. Oh, man. So here's the thing. I don't want to get too bogged down by the Davy Grant fight, but it does say something. You know, I, I think this is a 50-50 fight. 
but the fight is handicapped so closely that it's not just a situation where I think this is a flip of a co- not a flip of a coin, you know, a 50-50 fight, even though that that is the odds of flipping a coin. I don't want to get bogged down so much, but it is significant that Adrian Inez took 98 strikes from Davey Grant and did not get knocked out, while Jonathan Martinez did in almost half of that. Um, Yanez, if he wins this fight, the way to go is Yanez by TKO knockout, plus 200. That's a solid value. Martinez minus 115. I think, you know, I think that is the safer overall straight up. Vi- I don't know if this doesn't make any sense or not. With it, as close as it is, if I have to pick a straight up victor with as close as this is, I'm going Martinez minus 115. Now, I'm seeing this at minus 125, minus 130 some places. That is where, if you can get Adrian Yanez at plus money, I think that's probably worth it. But the thing is, you know, and I don't want to hold Yanez's last loss too much against him either because it came to Rob Font. And that's a better fighter than either of these two have fought. And it's a very different fighter um, than Saeed Nurmagomedov, who Jonathan Martinez had to get a close victory against. It was a big win for sure, and it was one I believe he was definitely the underdog in. But Martinez, by decision, plus 275, that is probably my favorite bet of this fight. This is a really interesting one. Um, I think there could be fireworks. I think there's at least going to be, you know, a combined 100 strikes landed. And if this fight goes the distance, who knows? It it could get way more up there. I I think it's going to be interesting, and I think that these guys are going to be popular this week when it comes to FanDuel and DraftKings. Next up, we are now to the co-main event of the evening, a women's flyweight matchup between Vivian Araujo and Jennifer Maya. Maya is the mild favorite, minus 162. Vivian Araujo, the underdog at plus 136. Let's start off with Vivian Araujo. Loser of three of her last four fights. Very, this is like the most flyweight, women's flyweight division lineup of fights and results ever. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fights in a row, all ending by unanimous decision, whether she won or lost them. Uh, she had two straight victories against Montana De La Rosa and Roxanne Matafari. She outstruck Roxanne 86 to 80 to 46 and landed four takedowns to nil January of 2021. She took a loss to Caitlin Chukagian, where she got outstruck 127 to 89 May of 2021. Then, once she was fighting in 2022 May, this is her last win, a unanimous decision over Andrea Lee. She got out struck 47 to 39. She got knocked down once, landed three takedowns to one. So uh, a lot of statistical things going on in that fight. Very flyweight lineup. And then this is the confusing part. Viva Naraho then loses two in a row. First to Alexa Grasso, who is still the UFC women's flyweight champion. She got outstruck 153 to 126. She landed 126 strikes against Alexa Grasso and the only two takedowns of the fight. That wasn't even that long ago, October of 2022. Not even a year ago, barely, but still. And then March of this year, loses a unanimous decision victory to one Amanda Rebus. Um, There's actually done more losing, you know, most recently than than I expected. But Amanda Rebus, you know, has always struck me as a dynamic fighter. So I... I don't want to hold that too much against her. She did get outstruck 98 to 46 and taken down twice. So very weird mixed results there against the likes of Grosso and Amanda Rebus. Jennifer Maya is actually two years younger, if you can believe it. She will be at a four-inch reach disadvantage. But of all things, she is coming off two straight wins where she looked great um, and was great for DFS, and I think that's going to be the case here. Only one fight in her entire UFC run, did not go the distance. And it was her first round armbar victory over Joanne Wood, who I might at the time have been Joanne Calderwood, August of 2020. Also, as it went against Roxanne Modafari, where it looks very similar in the striking numbers, there were just no takedowns. Why I always think Jennifer Maya is always good for two takedowns, that's always in my head, and I always know it's wrong. But now, she's won three of her last five. And the two losses came to Caitlin Chikagian, who she at least limited to 72 strikes. She didn't let her land 127 like Vivian Araujo did. And then she loses a unanimous decision to Manon Furio. March of 2022, and Manon, I know for some reason people kind of hate on her now. But, um, I mean, 
So uh, that's a, I, I think a higher no, it's not a higher quality of two losses, but I think it's real damn comparable to the two losses that Vivian Araujo has taken. The difference, Jennifer Maya has now bounced back with a you know two fight winning streak against Mariana Morose, who she outstruck one hundred nine to eighty in rounds of unanimous decision victory in November twenty twenty two, and March of this year, she gets a unanimous decision victory over Casey O'Neill, outstrikes her one forty five to one thirty seven quietly. Quietly, Jennifer Maya has landed a combined 254 strikes over this two-fight winning streak. That is going to be too much for Vivian Araujo. Striking volume gives her problems. And I I think that throughout the, the course of Jennifer Maya's career, you know, the only person that has managed to take her down more than twice has been... Uh, or was it? It was Valentina Shevchenko who took her down five times. She landed a takedown against Shevchenko and, and got that one round, uh, if you'll recall. And Liz Carmouche took her down three times in her UFC debut, July of 2018. Maya has just looked fantastic. And it, it seems like she's the kind of fighter who's, you know, was, I don't know, getting over the hill maybe? But, like, it's already been five fights since she fought for that title against Valentina Shevchenko. I think that minus 162 is an absolute bargain for Jennifer Maya. I think that, you know, you can do comparison fighter math and comparisons against the opponents that they've faced all day, but that never makes any sense at UFC women's flyweight. Jennifer Maya is going to win this fight by unanimous decision. I think that happens about 75 times out of 100. Minus 162. Hammer it home. <laughs> Maya by decision, minus 125. I think you might as well just go with that uh, because I think that's just as good as a, as a bet on Maya um, to win. You know, if she does it, I think she's going to do it by decision. I think she's going to land 80-plus strikes in this fight. And, you know, it might even be a close decision if Araujo does land one or two takedowns. But this is a lower level of competition than Maya has, you know, performed against in the past at a better rate. I think, you know, if you do go Araujo, Plus 136 is just not a good enough number. I think you got to go Raja by decision plus 225, but that is not my bag. And now we are to the main event of the evening, folks. Break out the red panties. And it is a featherweight matchup between Nigeria's Sadiq Youssef and Edson Barboza, of course, from Brazil. Interesting fight. Number 12 in the world at featherweight, Sadiq Youssef. Number 15 in the world at featherweight, Edson Barbosa, according to topology.com. Um, this is not, and we were also supposed to get David Dvorak versus Tatsuro Tyra on this card. That could have been a main event. Uh, I, I really, I hope we get to see that soon. Uh, now I want to check, actually. Just, nope. That, uh, I'm not saying that that fight's been rescheduled, but my God, I need to see that fight. Anyway, Sadiq Youssef is the minus 166 favorite. Barboza, the plus 140 underdog. Edson Barboza. Look, I'm not, I haven't even gotten into the analysis of this fight yet, but what I will say to you, kind hey, sir. One comment, man, one comment. No, don't be scared, homie. Don't be, you're Edson Barboza. You have a 75-inch reach, born in 1996. You've been in the UFC since November of 2010. You have some of the sickest knockouts in the history of this sport, a la Terry Edom, the way he put him away. Wins over Ross Pearson, um, Danny Castillo, Evan Dunham, Bobby Green, Paul Felder, Showtime Pettis, Gilbert Melendez, Benil Darius, Dan the Hangman Hooker, Laquan Amir Connie, Shane Burgos, and Billy Quarantillo, but we'll get to that in a second. Barbosa's been around for so long that... It's hard to talk about, like, his sample size because he's also taken, you know, I mean, look at the the fighters he's lost to. Cowboy Cerrone, Michael Johnson, Tony Ferguson, Habib Nurmagomedov, Kevin Lee, Justin Gaethje, Paul Felder in the rematch that they had, um, Dan Ige, Giga Chikadze, and Bryce Mitchell. He's now lost two of his last three. Let's talk about his last five. Unanimous decision victory over Maquani Americani. Uh, struck him 32 to 11, got taken down three times. Landed two knockdowns, but did not get the finish. Then he gets a third-round knockout, May of 2021, against Shane Burgos in a firefight, 98 to 80 on the striking for Edson Barboza. Then knocked out in the third round by Giga Chikadze, August of 2021, 
60 to 33 on the strike in for Giga. Two knockdowns before he finally put him away. Then this is like an, a, a classic Bryce Mitchell fight. It was the you know the biggest name that it, it propelled him to a different level in fans' eyes. He outstruck Edson 34 to 16. Got four takedowns to nil. Got a knockdown. Gets the unanimous decision. That was March of 2022. Then Edson Barboza returns. April of this year gets a first round knockout via knee over Billy Q. 21 to 19 on the striking ultimately before that fight was finished. So if he was coming off those two straight losses and his last fight was March of 2022, I would be terrified. And I, I think that, you know, th- this is a fight that I don't want to see Edson Barboza look bad in. But in coming back and knocking out Billy Quarantillo, a guy who's done a good amount of winning against strong opponents, you know, it, sandwiched over top of that Barboza loss is a knockout victory over Alexander Hernandez and a unanimous decision over Damon Jackson where he landed 100 strikes. Uh, he landed 100 strikes against Gabriel Benitez and 164 against Shane Burgos prior to the Hernandez fight. So coming back and beating Billy Quarantillo is absolutely nothing to sneeze at for Edson Barboza. Sadiq Yusuf will be at a four-inch reach disadvantage. He is seven years younger. This guy has one loss in the UFC, uh, and that is in eight fights dating back to July of 2018, counting his contender series victory over Mike Davis, where he landed 111 strikes en route to a unanimous decision victory. Notable victories. Shaman Moraes, by unanimous decision, lands 73 strikes back in March of 2019. Gabriel Benitez, that was a first-round knockout August of 2019. That was the night of Cormier versus Stipe 2 at UFC 241. Um, this is impressive and much needed against the guy with the worst nickname in the sport, Andre Touchy Feely, outstrikes him 73-49. to 49. Got taken down three times, wins the unanimous decision. That was at McGregor versus Cowboy. UFC 246, he gets put on a lot, of, a lot of big events, or at least he did. And now he's able to kind of, you know, step into larger roles on some of these fight night cards. There's one loss, unanimous decision, April of 2021 to Arnold Allen. Can't hold it too strongly against him there. Um, that was on the fight night, Vittori versus Holland card. He did land 47 strikes to 21 over Arnold Allen, but he got taken down twice and knocked down once. Um Ultimately, on the judges' scorecards, this ended up being a 29-28 on all three. So it ended up still being a close fight. And then does something very impressive, something that a lot of people cannot do, and a lot uh, something that a lot of people aren't mentally ready to do. March of last year, he gets a unanimous decision victory over Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres. Uh, got outstruck 66-64. They each landed a takedown. But ultimately, on the judges' scorecards, uh, he got he won thirty to twenty seven and twenty nine twenty eight. Although that twenty nine twenty eight was Mike Bell, um, so who knows? Who knows? Last time out against Don Shanus, and now his last fight was now October of twenty twenty two. But he did get a very quick submission victory by Guillotine. Um, that was it. The UFC fight night headline by Mackenzie Dern versus Yan Xiaonan. This is going to seem... Look, I think Sadiq and Edson will both get some burn in DFS this week. And I think that makes sense. We haven't seen Sadiq Yusuf knocked out. And he's had, I mean, good striking volume performances. You know, but his best came in the contender series. That's the only one he got into triple digits with. And he only has one knockout. Got into the 70s twice against Shaman Moraes and Andre Feely. Got in the 60s once against Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres, which I actually think is his best victory. Uh, just in the quality of competition, how tough of an out Bruce Leroy is any given night. Uh, and then, man, is it just like crazy for me to say that I, I think that Edson Barboza wins this? I mean, it was only... Like nine months before Sadiq Yusuf's last fight. No. Yes. No. No, I'm very wrong about that. It was like well over a year. That was that was some weird uh, calendar math. But Edson Barboza, I don't know if he's lost that much of a step. You know, when you come back after almost a year, or over a year, again, there it is with the calendar, in a Bryce Mitchell fight, which I think he would, that was kind of a bad matchup. You know, Bryce can take you down. 
and his jujitsu is very aggressive, but he doesn't even need to submit you with it. You know, he can just control you with it, use it offensively, and still do damage at the same time. Um, to come back and, and get that knockout over Billy Quarantillo is a big deal. Is Sadiq Yusuf closer to Billy Quarantillo, or is he closer to Giga Chikadze? I haven't seen enough from Sadiq Yusuf yet to be this confident in him. That seems crazy to me. Um, and God, I, I'm now over the hour mark, and I feel like I could now think about this for 30 straight minutes. I, this is a fight that I think a lot of people might be afraid to pick Edson because you don't want to look stupid and picking the guy that's been around for a billion years who's fought everybody. But having a, a win now eight months after Sadiq Yusuf's most recent fight, which was just, you know, a win over Don Shanus, who is 0-2 in the UFC. That was his UFC debut. That doesn't mean a whole lot to me, man. I, I think that Edson Barboza, once again... Nick, one comment, man, one comment. No, don't be scared, homie. Edson Barboza says this is going to be a war. Even though... It, because, you know, that's the thing, too. Edson Barbosa got knocked out by Giga Chikadze, who was doing that to a lot of different people. He did to Cub Swanson, Jamie Simmons. Um, oh, you know, man, like, but... Sadiq only has one knockout. That's That's enough for me. Look, if I'm wrong about Sadiq Yusuf, I will know after this weekend, at least against this level of competition. Before that, if Edson Barboza says this is going to be a war, it is a war that it shall be. I, I think that this is about a 50-50 matchup right now. If I had to give a nod, once again, maybe 55 out of 100 for Sadiq Yusuf, just on the upward trajectory, the fact that he's been winning more. But Edson having a fight more recently against a fighter that we all respect in Billy Quarantillo, Edson Barboza plus 140. I don't, it's not a lock. It's not one of my favorite picks, even though it's a plus money. But ultimately, Edson Barboza plus 140, that is the pick I like. Hit it. And I don't think, like, it also seems kind of impractical to go with a method of victory here. I think Barboza by TKO knockout plus 215. I don't hate that. This is going to be five rounds. There's more time to get a knockout. This is going to test Sadiq Yusuf's ability, you know, if he can't put this away early, in which, you know, he hasn't done for the majority of his career, then it's, you know, it's going to test that tank. And so I, I think that, you know, obviously Barboza's best chances to get a knockout will be early. But, like, Sadiq Yusuf, I think his most likely route to victory here is is a is by decision. And, you know, maybe... Over the course of five rounds, he lands close to 100 strikes. You know, maybe it's a 98 to 80 kind of situation for Sadiq Youssef in a victory here. So, I don't know. Youssef by decision, plus 275. That's probably the best individual method of victory bet. But ultimately, I think I like Barboza plus 140 just as much. Folks, that's it. For episode 113 of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast, Tap That. Kind of an unceremonious ending with that main event. I'm still left with questions. I might lose sleep over it tonight. I'm recording this on Wednesday night. We're looking forward to UFC Vegas 81 this weekend. It has been a mad, mad, mad week in the sport of mixed martial arts. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. That's where I make picks for all the major MMA promotions, regional promotions, major boxing events, LFA, Cage Fury, Cage Warriors, Invicto 1, PFL, Ryzen, Bellator, you name it, I'm picking it. Um, follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Be in the Roto Baller MMA Discord this week, 2 to 3 p.m. to talk DFS and sports betting strategy for UFC Vegas 81. Follow, like, subscribe, give love to the podcast, spread the word at Tap That MMA Podcast. That's on YouTube, Spotify, and that's where you can find the Facebook page. Check out my interlude episode with Dre Miley, the one eyed dragon. That was a great conversation. I got more interlude episodes coming, as always. Hopefully next week we can get Connor Bone Sloan on the show to talk UFC 294, which has been an ever-evolving monster. Folks, thanks for listening this week. Have yourselves a great time watching these fights. This is the calm before the storm, and it's still going to be 12 fights of UFC action. Have a great weekend. Peace.
break out the red panties.